Coming up on this week's episode of Search with Candor, I will be talking with Riley Hope all about reporting in SEO, specifically focusing on small and medium businesses, what important metrics to report, how we're going to report it, and the kind of software to use as well. All of that coming up on this week's episode of Search with Candor. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Search with Candor. I am your host, Jack Chambers-Ward. Welcome to episode three of season three with my special guest, Riley Hope, talking all about reporting for small and medium-sized businesses, something Riley and I both have quite a lot of experience with, so I think it was a really interesting chat to dive into our experience with different clients and different software and different options for reporting, because I know SEO reporting is a pretty hotly debated topic at the best of times. Of course, coming up in a minute, I'll have a word from both of our sponsors. I'll pass over to myself in the usual Candor studio. If you're watching this on YouTube or Spotify, you've probably noticed I'm at home at the moment. This is my home studio, not the official Candor studio. But don't worry, the rest of the episode, I will be back in the Candor studio. And like I said, here's a word from our sponsors before we get to my conversation with Riley Hope. <laughs> The first sponsor for this week's episode is Also Asked. You can go to alsoask.com and check out this fantastic and unique intent research tool. As we probably already know, search intent is at the core of everything we do as SEOs. Even if you're not directly working in content, understanding what your users are trying to achieve through their searches is still pretty important. I think we can all agree. On top of this, Google has told us that it takes up to nine searches for users to complete their goals. This can be a pretty hard picture to capture, to be honest, with traditional keyword research tools. So what if you could get hold of up to the minute questions that users have asked that have been clustered by intent by Google themselves? Well, that's exactly what Also Asked actually does. Also Asked mines and organizes Google's People Also Asked data in real time, showing you the next most likely question your searchers are going to ask. Best of all, it's completely free. You don't even need to create an account to try out Also Asked. Of course, if you do find it useful, there are paid options as well. We have the free, we have the light, and we have the pro options in terms of accounts that you can subscribe to. At the touch of a button from these accounts, you can download not only the questions people are asking, but also the answers Google has selected, the website URLs, and the titles that are ranking for those answers as well. Also Asked has the world's only API for people also asked data, meaning you can combine this data you're pulling from whatever questions you're asking directly into tools. You can combine it with things like ChatGPT to really supercharge your content briefs and transform the way you write content at scale. Go to alsoasked.com and check out this fantastic intent research tool today. Our next sponsor is Core Updates. That is the latest newsletter from the one and only Mark Williams Cook. You may know Mark from his unsolicited SEO tips and his appearances on this very show. He started this podcast, in fact, and is going to be my co-host every single month on our monthly news recap episodes. But if you just want a bit more Mark, you want all of his unsolicited SEO tips, get them actually solicited directly to your inbox every single week. You get the latest episode of this podcast. You get all of the latest SEO news and articles that Mark has selected and thinks are the things you should be paying attention to. All of that delivered to your inbox every single Monday. So if you want to get, like I said, Mark's usual recaps and stuff, it is one of the best places to go for the latest SEO news and pretty much what you can expect from the best in the industry when it comes to the articles and news that is going on, any updates from Google and all that kind of stuff. Go to coreupdates.com and sign up today to get SEO news, brand new episodes of this very podcast, and Mark's SEO tips delivered straight to your inbox. Coreupdates.com is the place to go. My guest for this week is a fantastic digital marketer who specializes in SEO and working with SMBs. You're going to find out what SMBs mean in a minute if you don't already know that. You may recognize them from appearances on Barry Schwartz's vlog, as well as Mordy's SEO rant and the Azeem Digital Podcast. Welcome to the show, Riley Hope. Hey, thanks for having me. 
thank you so much for coming on. I'm honored to be on that list. That's like three of the coolest people I know in SEO. Like Azim and Morty, I'm lucky to call friends and Barry is someone I look up to. So I'm honored to be on that list of podcasts you've been on. <laughs> um, very, very fortunate to know them and be a part of them. Just a shout out to Women in Tech SEO for helping me get connected with them and read the right people. And now I'm here. Even Always shout out Women in Tech SEO. I think it's... Uh, a community that gets mentioned every like few episodes pretty much in, the, in this podcast because of how awesome it is shout out to reach and everybody who's working there and and making things happen and stuff because it is a super cool community that we always hear nothing but positive things about when when guests come on the show and talk about it and uh yeah i'm glad it's giving people opportunities to spread the word get out there you know practice public speaking skills going on podcasts all that kind of stuff and uh yeah shout out to women in tech seo you're awesome awesome community <laughs> So I kind of hinted at SMBs at the top of the show. I just dropped that abbreviation in there without kind of explaining it. But we want to talk about small and medium businesses and specifically focusing on reporting for those businesses because, as I'm sure plenty of the listeners, and I'm sure you know, Riley, we're going to be working on a pretty limited budget, limited resources, all that kind of stuff when it comes to these kind of companies. So I guess my opening question to you is, what was the thought behind bringing this topic to the table? Why is this something you're passionate about and why you wanted to talk about on the podcast before we get into the topic itself? Yeah. Um, so to kind of go into that, we can also talk about like the little acronym and the main reason that I use it. So I actually <laughs> have a degree from the Pong for me, but um, from University of Stirling in Scotland in social enterprises and third sector organizations. So um, with that, that kind of led me to um, develop like an idea for my own social enterprise being to work with small businesses or small to medium sized businesses. So um, I've always worked with small to medium sized businesses, you know, professionally, I started out in the nonprofit sector and that led me to um, the third sector kind of organization in the UK and then to where I am now. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I'm a kind of similar, similar sort of thing with my clients over the years where mostly small, quite a lot of local stuff, some sort of medium, some sort of slightly national companies. But yeah, funny enough, uh, a couple of episodes ago, I had Matt Hepburn on the show talking about enterprise SEO and like the complete opposite of that, where there's like, <laughs> oh, we only deal with companies with a $250 million turnover or, or a billion dollar turnover, or whatever it was. And I was like, I can't even imagine working with a company like that. <laughs> Pretty much all my experience is so much smaller. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It's always a shock like to see and to hear like just on SEO Twitter, like the large sized budgets that people are working with. And then I think people also forget in our industry, hey, the small restaurant that you go to down the street probably also needs that SEO help or the <laughs> pub or the bar, or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. So and I think reporting is something so much of SEO is so much of our time is often dedicated to to thinking about whether you're working in agency, whether you're working freelance, you've got to tell your clients what you're doing, what the results are, all that kind of stuff. But there are a million different ways to do that. I know some people do it through presentations, some people, uh, if we're going to get into this, just export stuff from tools where they should not just be like, hey, just have a SEMrush export, just have an HREFs export, whatever it is, like just just white label it and throw it at a client and some people build custom reports and things like looker studio and all that kind of stuff as well so i guess we need to start off with thinking about how we understand the client right get to what they want from us what they want from us working in seo and what their goals are and understand what we need to be measuring right yeah, definitely. My favorite like type of situation with a client is like when you start out your services, like in your onboarding form, have like kind of a set and expectations. And I think a lot of people do this already, especially with small business SEO, where it's like, hey, you're probably not going to be able to see a lot of results in these first few months because we're gathering research or um, we're doing some kind of core fixes. And then after like, I usually, I usually kind of fall in line with that, like, three to six months, just depending on the client, depending on the location, things like that. And then we'll be able to measure. So I think in that expectation setting, it's like, hey, are you looking for more quality traffic? Are you looking for just more traffic? You know, what are some goals that you have for your site? And then give that to us and then let us like translate it into a kind of an SEO type feel. Yeah, definitely. I think having that initial onboarding conversation is so important, especially for 
as you were saying, like, I think a lot of these smaller businesses have probably never worked with an agency or a freelance or even understand what SEO is. So you're really going from that ground up approach and having to establish like, by the way, this is what this means. And this is why this is important. And this is why I think this is important to you and your business, right? It's not kind of, oh, yeah, this massive company that's worked with a million agencies before, and you're just kind of the next one filling the slot or whatever it is <laughs> there needs to be that kind of more personal approach to it from my experience yeah definitely and also just explaining like what different things are like i've had to go down into details and explain what a keyword is to a client and it's like i feel like a lot of people with seo like if you kind of break it down they understand um but like you were saying with like the white labeled exports if you send over like even me like just like a labeled SEMrush export I'm gonna be like okay what do you want what what do you want me to do with this if you have no <laughs> kind of findings or anything there so it's really important I think on that so on that small business scale especially is to know who you're talking to um and to know what kind of they're looking for so if someone is looking for more quantity traffic I'm gonna have more traffic based metrics in my reporting versus if they're looking for more quality of traffic I'm looking at things like maybe CTR I'm gonna look at maybe traffic cost if I'm using utilizing SEMrush or you know just looking at the different um engagement metrics and this is why I also love GA4 now I know like controversial opinion but um because <laughs> User quality metrics in GA4 are just so helpful at explaining, hey, you know, maybe we're not seeing as much traffic coming through, or maybe we're not seeing those big increases that we would like, but we're seeing our engagement time increase, we're seeing our overall engagement rate increase, those in, those engaged sessions and metrics like that, they really kind of make the extra mile there. Yeah, I think GA4 is a really interesting thing to discuss because again like you said it's such a hot topic obviously even now it's been rolled out for six months at this point you think everybody would have calmed down but we're still the majority of the community is still angry i think still fuming and, and mourning the loss of ua but i think you're totally right with those engagement metrics because of the way google has been moving towards better tracking of user experience on site and how they're transitioning through from page to page and and from event to event specifically obviously with ga4 being event-based tracking I think that's a hugely important thing to kind of counterbalance everybody like, oh, yeah, we've got great bounce rate and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know about you, Riley, but I don't rate bounce rate particularly highly as a as a metric of much going forward for, for pages and things like that. And the opposite of that, right, is engagement rate, which I actually think yeah. is a far more valuable metric to keep track of. Yeah, definitely. And then with bounce rate as well, something that I always come across, especially for smaller sites is if they have a really high bounce rate on a particular page, they're going to be asking why. And you know, there's so many reasons why a page can have either a really high bounce rate or a really low bounce rate. And obviously, you know, when you're looking at reporting, it's also really key, I think, to segment that kind of situation out or explain why, hey, you have a really high overall bounce rate because of this specific subset of pages. And here's why those pages would naturally have a higher bounce rate than say your homepage or something else. And you know, it just varies by industry too. I think another thing is, is just going across the globe or just going across from state to state, you know, town to town, wherever you are, different people do things different ways. So if you have like a younger audience, I think they may be quicker to bounce than maybe your older audience or something like that, you know? Yeah, I really don't envy like you guys in the US or people who work with a lot of international <laughs> clients having to deal with so many differences in such a small like space of time, right? You could you can be working on one client in one state where they're looking for this thing and the regulations are this way and then the next time you're working in a different state with completely different regulations and I think we're fairly lucky here in the UK with we're all kind of under the same umbrella and kind of like even across England, Scotland and Wales, we're kind of similar in most of our kind of like digital regulation stuff, although a lot of that is changing with the Google antitrust laws and all that kind of stuff that's happening at the moment. But yeah, I, th I think it's really interesting to think about that and how perhaps, you know, that business is only working in one specific location and there are specific things you want to track for location based stuff, right? You want to understand where traffic is coming from, where the users are coming from. And that might not be something that a massive conglomerate is particularly interested in because they will have separate sites for each type of thing. They might have a, a European site or even a, a French language site or a Spanish language site or whatever. But tracking local stuff, I think, is can be hugely important for small, medium-sized businesses when they're dealing with that kind of thing and they want to get 
you know, how do you tr translate that to people actually coming in the door to a store or actually people coming in and inquiring and things like that? Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the biggest things with the data regulations is, um, you know, working with businesses in the UK, you learn how much stricter privacy laws and things like that are versus the US. <laughs> so explaining the fact that, you know, we can't go back through like the nth of time in Google Search Console anymore. And that thresholding exists in GA4 and things like that, even to other like SEOs has been like absolutely like mind boggling for people who just work in the US because it's like, what do you mean? We can't track people down to the T. But um, <laughs> aside from that, um, you know, just like uh, with local SEO, I think also one of the biggest things is tools and the price of those tools, because, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there, but they can get very expensive very fast. Um, one of my entries into SEO, I'll say, or entries into keyword research was Google Trends, which I know it's not 100% accurate, but it's nice to kind of look at things from a broad scale, but it doesn't really translate well, like internationally, like in the US, we can get a pretty like decent sized region, you know, and like kind of narrow it down to maybe like central Florida or something like that. Um, but, you know, internationally, it's kind of like a hit or miss. Like, I think one time it gave me like all of Australia and I was like, I'm sure there's some <laughs> monolith there, but, um, you know, stuff like that. And then also, um, I like AdWords Keyword Planner. I know this may be like also kind of unpopular, but it's free and you can get down to like the nitty gritty for your like specific locations. And personally, I'm also a bright local like diehard. Um, I love everything they post, the guides and the blogs that they post like for everyone to kind of see is just amazing there. This is it sponsored. I wish if they, <laughs> if they want to send us merch now, we'll take it. <laughs> hey, bro, I like all of you want to sponsor the podcast. Please come and come and say hi. We're looking <laughs> for sponsors for this season. So hit me up, bright local. <laughs> and hit Riley up as well. Send some, <laughs> they have some amazing hoodies and hats and stuff like, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that is a huge factor. Like when you're thinking about setting yourself up with working with smaller businesses and you're thinking about even like agency wide, let alone, you know, individuals as a freelance, but putting your own money on the line when it comes to a $500 subscription to this tool every month. And it's like, well, then I need to make enough money from the clients to balance out the paying for the tools and all that kind of can get so overwhelming so quickly. I think you're totally right starting off with the basics and thinking about the free stuff you can get we mentioned ga4 already you can already get so much data and so much information just from looking at ga4 your search console google trends looking at the google autocomplete stuff the people also ask data all that kind of stuff that is already available to you through the serps through the basic tools that are already there as part of google service i think is something a lot of people kind of underrate and and there are, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of tools that allow you to then build upon that and automate a lot of those processes and stuff. But if you're working on a fairly small scale, I think you can really start off with super, super low budget tool providing, but actually still providing a good service for your clients and then building that into a lot of your reports and stuff as well. You can still take that data and, and make it usable and make it translatable for the client as well, right? Yeah, definitely. And Looker Studio, I feel like, is one of the more underrated tools. Um, I think we have a thing kind of in SEO where we get kind of bougie too quick. And it's like those tools are great, but there's free ones that do the same thing. Yeah, definitely. Looker is something we use a lot here at Canada when it comes to reporting to our clients and when we're trying to kind of take the data and also add analysis and and you know present those like i love the interactive kind of dashboard kind of style of looker when you can set it up so the client can filter the table and see by queries and there's that almost like level of transparency right we're like we're not fudging these numbers we're not fudging this data or anything like that you can go in and you can this is a direct pull from search console or ga4 and the client can have a play around and have a look at it i find that stuff so interesting and so fascinating and i love like building little dashboards and stuff that i think can really help visualize so much of it to the client because you can chuck a bunch of numbers at a, lo at a lot of people and they mean absolutely nothing but if you translate it into a particular kind of graph or a visualization or whatever that transforms how they understand that data yeah definitely and with looker too like you like especially for small businesses a lot of the time i find that like we're the only marketing provider they're working with. 
So if they're doing other things as well, they may want to know how those are performing too. And Looker just makes it so easy. So it's like, hey, I can kind of throw you a bone here and just, you know, pull in all of your traffic channels into GA4 if you want it um, and that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I think cost is something that makes people kind of turn away from small businesses where it's really a sector or just, you know, nationwide, nationwide globally that we kind of need to make sure that those businesses stay kind of in, that they say in existence, um, you know, um, here in the U.S. we have Walmart. I'm sure you love Tesco, but let's keep <laughs> the other ones alive too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm loving the U.K. knowledge here. This is not what I was expecting. You just drop in a Tesco in there casually from your, <laughs> from your um, experience Tesco, in the U.K. <laughs> yeah, no, Tesco was life-changing for me. It was my first like international experience. I wasn't kind of used to like the smaller grocery stores. I grew up in like Florida. Everything's big, vast, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Life changes after your first meal deal, right? Like that is just game, a game-changing exactly. moment. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so we kind of talked about GA4. Let's talk about Search Console because I think Search Console is probably my favorite for just that as, as close as you can get kind of to that first-party data from Google, right? Like where would your focus be in terms of thinking about Obviously, it varies from client to client. This is kind of goes without saying for each point here. But in general, what would kind of be your focus points for looking at Search Console and the kind of data you'd want to be bringing into reports for clients and things like that? Yeah. So for me, I always like to start year over year if I can with the caveat, like if someone wasn't working with me in that like 13th month or in that prior period, I don't tend to report on that just because I don't know what they were doing. Like they can tell me what they were doing, <laughs> but like who knows? Um, so, you know, I try to start year over year, just three months over three months or 90 days over 90 days, however you want to say it. But, um, when I'm looking at search console, I'm mainly looking at pages and then from pages, I'll actually go into queries from there just because depending on, you know, with smaller sites, um, I think this isn't, this may not be as true, but different pages, you're going to generate different search terms and have different kind of, you know, how you're talking about different user behavior different places within search overall. So it's really important to kind of get a feel first with how different pages are doing. And something I always do with a, with like my onboarding is like, hey, what pages on the site are the most important to you or what key things are the most important for your business? And then that kind of translates back into looking at those specific pages and start there. I don't like to look at queries overall because even on the smallest site, like you're probably going to be ranking for at least 100 different search terms, like if they're just starting out. And I mean, you can comb through individual queries all day, but another thing with small businesses or just SEO in general is you're going to be ranking for a lot of similar searches too. So that's going to be kind of key there is to start with pages and then from there, just kind of look at um, the actual keywords or the actual queries from there. And then if you can match it up with maybe a different tool, see what, you know, SEMrush is saying, Ahrefs, whatever your favorite next tool is. But if there is no next tool, honestly, it's okay too to start out like that. Yeah, I think that cross-referencing can be really interesting to see where the differences are. And even just between analytics and search console, you can see a significant difference depending on the way people are arriving to the site and all that kind of stuff and, and the, the attribution models that GA4 now uses, depending if you're using the blended model or the first click or the last click or whatever it is, like understanding how all that stuff kind of relates to each other. And I think you're totally right. Looking at pages and queries is interesting and queries can oft be so often full of a bunch of fluff and rubbish that you just get kind of like, oh yeah, great. We rank for this term. Nobody cares about Well, we've grown, you know, 45 places our average position has increased or whatever but actually getting clicks from that thing is very unlikely because you're kind of tangentially ranking for it and not actually actively if want a better phrase actively targeting that keyword um, i think a lot of people also kind of misunderstand average position and 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 ctr and stuff like that and kind of really really hone in and focus on all of that stuff and then kind of report that to the client in a way that doesn't quite make sense yeah um yeah average position is one of those where it's like if you're growing it's probably going down but you know if you've reached the maximum amount of traffic you want i guess it's okay to see it like you know decline great 
you know, um, I know month to month, like those metrics vary, but also with CTR, I feel like that's one that so many people get stuck on, especially if they try to compare SEO to SEM or like a paid version of advertising. And it's like, we're, we're, we're similar, but we're not the same. We're, we're cousins <laughs> at best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think CTR is always something a lot of people come into you thinking about almost like how that directly translates to where you are in the SERPs and how much you're being seen and all that kind of stuff. And I think it can be a factor where if you see a significant change in that stat, like, oh, suddenly the impressions have gone up, but the clicks have gone down. That's kind of natural, by the way. That That's kind of how, you know, you're not going to suddenly also get all of the clicks as well as all the impressions. There is kind of this delayed relationship between the two, right? That you're not going to suddenly... Um, spike up and see both i often find for me where you know you kind of start off getting the impressions first and then the clicks will come a, a, on a little bit of a delay do you have kind of similar experience railing you, you seem to be nodding along thank you yeah <laughs> yeah exactly or um you know and i know this doesn't happen all too often anymore with small businesses but if you're holding a featured snippet for something you're probably not going to get a lot of clicks if people are finding their answer through the cert through the SERPs or like through the search result pages or any type of SERP feature. If you're ranking for that and the answer is right there in the SERPs for that query, like you're probably not gonna get a lot of clicks, but those impressions, they're still nice. They're still doing things on Google side, just, you know, calm down is usually when I have to reiterate to people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, I, I was talking to uh, another podcast about this not too long ago about kind of the zero click search side of things, right? And you, you're totally right there. You've When you get a featured snippet, like that can actually do other things outside of just bringing clicks because chances are it's not actually going to bring that many clicks to the to the actual page, but you can build brand awareness. I can, oh, wow, I, I saw this particular site was on the featured snippet when I searched this thing. And then two weeks later, I search a similar thing. I'm still looking for... A similar product or service and the brand is there again on another feature snippet like oh they really must know what they're talking about like it, it's kind of being visible and being aware we use the term visibility but like it's a very literal term sometimes when you literally see the same brand multiple times on multiple SERPs for related queries you suddenly kind of almost subconsciously i think there's the the statistic of like the more traditional marketing stuff where like you have to see a brand like seven times before you purchase anything or something like that and i think it's similar on SERP sometimes like i will go around and see a competitor or a particular site a few different times not clicking the first time not clicking the second time but maybe third fourth fifth i'll be like oh yeah maybe they do know what they're talking about maybe i should check their content out you know <laughs> yeah definitely i i mean i think a lot of like those traditional marketing facets can be applied to seo in some way um you know and then with that as well just building brand awareness the way that you know you're kind of saying from a user end i think google also kind of does it in their own way without kind of stating it explicitly so it's like those pages with those third features they're doing something whether you can't, whether you can see it from the user end or from the Google end, having those strong like traffic performing pages, those keyword gaining pages, whatever it may be, um, they're doing some good even if they're not necessarily generating traffic. And I know with with SEO for small businesses and just anyone who isn't a franchise or an enterprise nowadays, it's really hard to kind of hit that home. Um, which is why like in reporting, like I always recommend, you know, I know we were talking about some engagement metrics earlier, but if you can have an engagement centered slide or like maybe um, a visibility or a keyword centric slide as well within your reporting, Looker Studio makes doing that really easy. I know like for a lot, for some people, for a lot of people that may be like overkill, but having that information just ready to go, you know, if someone's asking you about it is always going to be a game changer with any type of client. Yeah, I think there's a there's a brilliant thing called the SEO metric chain by Chris Green, where he goes through and kind of discusses what the kind of things you should be reporting on and in kind of what order. So like, when you make a technical change on the website, you're not going to suddenly see revenue increase because you fix this particular thing necessarily. But that then leads to potentially more rankings, which then lead to more impressions, which then lead to more clicks, which then potentially leads to eventually conversions and purchases and all that kind of stuff right now and understanding that journey not even for a user but for how data kind of flows through and, and the changes you make on the site then 
affect the overall site right and i think you're totally right understanding what you're reporting who you're reporting to and what they care about so if you think this company on you you know on your onboarding call hopefully you've had that conversation you've been like so you guys looking to increase brand awareness or is this just about making as much money as possible as quickly as you can but actually yeah we are interested in building our brand and kind of establishing ourselves and authorities like aha okay then you, I think you're totally right, Riley. You get into that process of like, well, then we can think about those visibility metrics and that that share a voice phrase that you hear sometimes people use, like compared to your competitors, how visible are you on relevant SERPs and all this kind of stuff, right? I think some people really care about that stuff and might not even know it's an option unless you as the SEO come to them and say, hey, this is a thing we can report on. Is this something you're interested in? Yeah, definitely. One of my biggest pet peeves with some SEOs is just treating clients like they're less than because they don't understand because this is a new industry. There was a time where you didn't understand either. You know, um, if someone wants to understand, definitely share the sources with them and, you know, just kind of be willing to explain, I guess, would be like a key thing. I always find like UK clients and just clients abroad are more willing to be more willing to learn seo compared to some <laughs> americans i think just kind of generalizing there i'm also on the east coast so the east coast of the us has some very um stigmas as just being very cut and dry so i'll say that too um but um yeah you know um summary slides always help when someone's like getting intro into seo and if your client doesn't want to learn seo that's like understandable too but you know yeah, I don't know uh, if you experience that too, where you have like um, clients maybe coming from bad experiences with past agencies and then just being like, I don't I don't know if I can learn this. And it's like, you, you can. It's OK. Yeah, I think there is a level of the element of education, right, when you're speaking to a brand new client. And even if they've worked with an agency before, again, perfect example you gave there was like, oh, they've worked with an agency and had a bad experience. You're almost having to go that extra step further and, and build in a, a little element of that customer service kind of thing. So I always find, you know, if they've really focused on one particular metric or one particular element of like, oh yeah, they brought us loads of clicks, but they never made us much money. Having a look at why that happened and why that might have been the focus of that agency. I mean, they're probably dodgy and potentially charlatans and all that kind of stuff, but you know, w what were they doing and what were they doing wrong and how can we change that and how you can better establish that rapport and that relationship with the client to be like hey we are working on the same page here we are working towards the same goals at the end of the day you want to do this we want to help you do that and that's why you're paying us the money right and i think that communication part of reporting like moving on from just the numbers and the data and stuff the actual insights and communication and all that kind of stuff that goes into report is so underrated in my opinion and so important to clearly establishing client you mentioned summary slides there like that is such a tiny little extra thing that just maybe for each section or even a very very high level executive summary thing right in the beginning so maybe you're talking to the marketing manager and they need to pass it up to their head of department who then passes it up to the ceo or whatever it is like i know we're talking about small businesses but there might still be layers of of, of marketing managers and stuff there that eventually goes to the boss they just want to know the numbers right at the front, that front page of like, hey, here's the executive summary. Everything is up. We're making more money. We're getting more traffic. Don't worry about it. The nitty gritty stuff is where you go in with your point of contact and your marketing managers and helping them kind of go through it, right? Yeah, definitely. My favorite like small business experience is like when you get like somebody's like kid and like their parents just own the <laughs> business and it's like yes. they need SEO help. And it's like, can you can you make this like just, you know, explain it as easily as you can because they're not going to learn it they don't want to just you know here you go and that's when like cases like that is when that summary slide comes in hand and also on the flip side like you were saying for like for like high, higher level executive ceos and things like that they probably also not want to go into that nitty-gritty so you know um i think at the agency level you know you can just create or the individual level whatever what, wherever you're working at um, you can just kind of create like the kind of template of the report there and I personally, like I mentioned, I'm a big fan of Looker. So you can easily make like those that template and then you're able to duplicate it out and then tweak it as need be. Uh, I know there's other great reporting methods too. Uh, Looker is just kind of one of my personal favorites for the main reason that it automatically updates. So 
Yeah, I think that automatic up updating is so handy. Like I said, having the interactive dashboardy style rather than if you're doing it in slides or or you know PowerPoint or whatever you want to use, where it's just a very static. Here's the thing: actually being able to move stuff around and shift and filter results and stuff. I know some clients have gone from I don't understand SEO, I don't want to talk about this to Oh, so we, I've, I've filtered the things in the report and found that these queries went up and these pages went down and this thing happened and they're, suddenly they're more engaged having that element of interactivity and, and giving them the time to, hey, you know, in this report, we're going to go through this, have a call with them, all that kind of stuff and go through the basics. But I'm not going to waste your time doing two hours going through every single individual piece of information. Go through it yourself. If you want to have a play around, please do all that kind of stuff. And if you have any questions, come back to me. And I found that really helps some clients like get really involved. And I'll get an email two days later being like, hey, I was I was testing the report and I filtered by this thing and I sorted by that metric. And now I can see that, oh yeah, you were right with this thing, but how come we didn't talk about this thing or, or that thing? And I find that stuff so interesting where the data then becomes part of that communication and then part of that education element to it right yeah definitely um something that um that i did in my dissertation is that i made out looker studio reports for um each kind of um business that i was working with oh, cool. and then by the end of it we had um we had like a slide of just like who to follow in seo seo news things like that so just having that kind of in there and integrated for those people who want to learn is like game changing it's like it feels just very inclusive and i think also at the um agency level or just you know the person doing seo it's going to go that much further with retention and things like that i know this isn't an old business per se but marketing in general you know we have kind of that connotation just I think globally of you know marketing people they're a little bit sleazy they're looking to like undercut you with things like that whatever it may be so anything to like help the industry reputation I think <laughs> that's a brilliant idea I hadn't even thought about that but yeah I've had conversations with clients not as part of the reporting of like oh hey I'm looking to learn SEO what kind of resources would you recommend like when you learned it what were you looking for are there any newsletters or podcasts or whatever to recommend I love that idea I might have to I might have to recommend that to the rest of the category be like hey we'd let's, let's include like a little resources thing at the end of like if you want to learn more go and check out these sites or these newsletters and stuff yeah I like that a lot yeah, definitely. Um, I think it just goes the extra way. I hate love when people ask me like, oh, like, what did you use to get into SEO at first? And I was like, I can hand you like a thousand screaming frog crawls and then you can go through them and like attempt it. Like, you know, you aren't a real SEO, I think, especially with small businesses until you accidentally take down your first one from a site. That's what I have to say. Yeah. Until you've had that pain. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I, w I had a client who had, I think it was 65 active plugins at once that was a custom build, according to the developer. And I was like, I don't think that's how WordPress works, dude. Like, that's that's not, that's not what I would consider a custom build, but was like 65 plugins on top of a template does not a custom build make. Yeah, I, I know. For some clients, when I get them like that, I was like, I just want to give you like a Tumblr blog, you know, like an, <laughs> like an update in MySpace and just let you go at it. Like <laughs> sometimes you need to go back to basics, right? You just need to think about what actually matters and what we need to be doing, and not go too crazy. And I, I again, I've seen like small businesses uh, worry about the tiniest little thing, and then oh, by the way, we spent fifty thousand pounds on a new site on a CMS we've never used. I'm like, okay, isn't that your entire budget with us? Like, where, where did that? What? Who made that decision? Where did that come from? Like <laughs> suddenly from. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's two thousand pounds here and three thousand pounds there, and then suddenly, fifty grand just out the window towards a site you've never used. <laughs> yeah, I, I always ask clients when I get them like that. I was like, "Can you update the site that they're building?" And they're like, "No, but they're going to update it." It's just like you're gonna pay them forever and ever and ever. And um, you know, that's why I know WordPress like it gets its hate nowadays because there's so many other options out there, but. I always say there's a reason that WordPress is number one. If you get it through your hosting, it's free. I use WordPress. Um, you know, just probably like I'd say 20 plugins, like you're pushing it. Like probably you don't need more than 20 and that's like <laughs> pushing it. Yeah, I think that that's a safe spot to be. And I think when you get into the 
the upwards of the double digits. You're getting 30, 40, 50, and like I said, into the 60s with some of the clients I've worked with. You start getting stuff that clashes with each other. And when you're a small business, you don't need that many moving parts. You want, like you said, just go back to a simple blog, go back to a simple e-commerce store, whatever it is, like dial it back down to the simplest thing you can do. And as long as you can have CMS access, you can make changes and stuff. I think that can make a huge difference in terms of not getting too bogged down on the details, not getting too bogged down in all the, the technical worries and causing more problems for yourself in a way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And like with access to, I think that's like one of my main things with small businesses is if you are a small business owner and you are listening to this, you please do not give away your own access to your Google search console, to your Google analytics, or make sure that you're still added on it. You know, we're, we're a great industry, but we don't need all of, we don't need to own your own <laughs> access. You need to also own it, please. Agreed. Agreed. I have heard <laughs> horror stories of people just like emailing over their login details. So the owner, like account details, rather than like, yeah, I'll make you an admin. It's like, nope, no, no, no. please make me an admin and, and allow access to my account rather than just, like you said, handing over the details. I think somebody told me a horror story that was like they literally mailed them like a post-it note with the login details for their server on and stuff and i'm like oh my god that's so many layers of confusion and weirdness there <laughs> oh I, i'll send I, it over I, to you like oh, i didn't get your email i didn't send an email it's like oh no <laughs> i if, i feel like with the uk privacy laws like i feel like that's a a whole like other gdpr kind of a violation Probably. in of itself <laughs> um, yeah, probably probably oh, i can't believe that i don't think you know um i don't think i've like checked my mail in like three weeks so i can't imagine somebody <laughs> maybe, maybe there would be a few passwords in the mail for you really like yeah. oh perfect <laughs> perfect perfect um yeah just, just like um yeah and then with access to i don't know if you've encountered this um my biggest one that i encounter with small businesses and access is you know, our like web developer, whoever, somebody else had Google search console access if they had it set up in the past and I can't get a hold of them and I can't get it over. And then it's just like all this communication back and forth with someone who doesn't want to hand it over for whatever reason. It's a Google search console account. It's free. Like just add, add the person who should be at it. Yeah. I have had so many fights with previous developers or previous agencies and not wanting to like hand over accounts and stuff like that you're totally right where i had a previous client in, in my previous agency where it was just a, a couple running a small business out of their literally out of their spare room and they were doing kind of like uh i don't know how you describe it like gift box kind of thing so you'd get like for the the autumn box, you'd get a, a candle and some soap and a, and a chocolate bar and a whatever. Like, it was like little gift boxes, like fit through the letterbox, kind of like little thin things. And literally them running it out of their spare bedroom was like, oh, cool. Can I get CMS access? And they're like, what's a CMS? I'm like, okay, you might not know that phrase. So this, so it could be built on like WordPress or like, or like whatever else. Um, like, oh, no, no, our friend built it from scratch. I thought, okay. I mean, that's fine if they know what they're doing. The fact you said our friend built it worries me here. And they were like, yeah, we don't know how it works. We don't have any access to it. He does all of the updates himself, just hard coding it straight into the site. I was like, well, this is terrifying. All the recommendations I'm about to give you, you will not be able to do probably. So we're off to a good start. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's my biggest beef with um, developers. And then, you know, the clients like that, they come over to us and they're like, well, can't you code? And it's like, not like that. I can, I can change the, I can change the font color and some C on um, WordPress and do some CSS stuff for my like Tumblr, MySpace days. That's, that's about it. <laughs> I can make your e-commerce store look like MySpace. What more could you want? Exactly. Perfect. Great for the Y2K throwback. Exactly. We're in like a retro. We're throwing back to like the early 2000s right now. So making me feel very old as a 33 year old of like, I remember that round the first time. Oh no. Oh God. I feel so old now. <laughs> um, um, I will turn 25 later this year. So um, I'll call you in June and we can, we can have like um, a crisis together. <laughs> I look forward to it, mate. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> 
Um, so we're thinking about back to reporting, first of all, yes. uh, and thinking okay. about the kind of uh, <laughs> the options we can have for different clients and, and thinking about the kind of things we want to talk about. Do you think it's worth reporting kind of like wider industry news as well? We mentioned resources and stuff, right? Is it worth saying like, oh, by the way, this Google update happened. Oh, we think this is happening. Here's why you should... I don't know, worry about SGE or AI or whatever, like start stirring the pot and scaring the clients a bit? Or do you think that's something that should be kept very separate? Or is there kind of a, a, a balance in the middle there for like, hey, this update happened and it may have affected the site in this way? Yeah, I think having that balance is good because regardless of if it's affecting your site, it's going to affect the SERPs overall. So, you know, just kind of having that like, hey, this update happened, it just rolled out, like John Mew tweeted about it, whatever it is, um, very short tweeted about it, whatever. Um, you know, just kind of having that like knowledge in there and just saying like, hey, this happened, this may or may not have an impact on you yet, but regardless, we're looking at it. And I think the main thing with any SEO service, regardless of if you started in 2000, if you started yesterday, you know, just with any kind of um, search engine optimization, you need to make sure that you have like a person is on the other end of searching for something, be there to meet it and not like a spammy way. If you're doing anything to try to like get around Google in 2024 now, what are you doing? But also like, it's not going to work. <laughs> Uh, just you know stay true to your business stay true to what seo is it's, hu it's human nature to want an answer just be there with that and google will follow yeah i think that's a huge part of a learning curve for most seos of like you learn pretty quickly like oh you're gonna fight google on this thing you're gonna try and be sneaky about it and, go and don't get me wrong i'm sure the black hats are out there screaming at their their YouTube or their or their phones or whatever, being like, "Hey, th this is this is actually still does work. I can still use PBNs and get rankings." I'm like, "I'm sure you can, but eventually it's going to catch up with you. you if you want to fight a com company like one of the biggest technology companies in the history of the world, be my guest. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick that fight personally. <laughs> I don't think I have the technology or the or the understanding to to fight Google on much of this stuff. They're going to catch up eventually, right?" Yeah, definitely. I think the only kid, the only person who can fight Google at this point is the kid who hacked Rockstar Games with the Amazon Fire Stick. That is insane. Huh. Funnily enough, I mentioned this on last week's episode as well. We we talked more. We were talking about security and hacking and stuff. That blew my mind. The fact that he was under like for like house arrest in a hotel room and used an Amazon Fire Stick to hack. <laughs> that's like blew my mind. Blew my mind. Yeah, that's crazy. I can like, I, I don't even think I can log into my own WordPress account without like logging in through my hosting for some props to have. <laughs> There's just levels to this thing, you know. Yeah. Like we're we're just clearly not on the hacking through an Amazon Fire Stick level. <laughs> yeah, um, props to him. I I hope that I know they said that they institutionalized him, but we really need you should really get him on this podcast and then just have him do a whole <laughs> thing about how. Maybe, uh, yeah, we should do some like real scandalous, like just get hackers. I'm sure there is a podcast for that already because there's a podcast for everything and like former hackers turned podcasters or whatever. Like <laughs> it's got to be something like that, right? <laughs> that would be great. Um, but yeah, um, you know, just like with SEO, I think a lot of people, um, when I started SEO, it was kind of around like the Panda update times, if I recall correctly. It was in the I'm going to buy 8,000 links on backlinks on Fiverr type stage <laughs> of the internet, and which like very helpful to swim on SEO during that time because you it just got kind of thrown in really quickly. Mm -hmm. But um, with that being said, you know, Google will take manual actions against your site, and you may be thinking, well, I see like larger businesses do this. And I say this with all the love in my heart to every small business, every medium sized business out there. Um, you're not going to be able to kind of weevil around the same way that a large business can or be as lackadaisy as they can. Yeah, I think that's I, a huge thing for a lot of businesses. To us. I've had that exact same conversation, right? Well, uh, well, I've seen Amazon do it. Well, I've seen a huge international household name do it. I'm like, yeah, because they're an international household name. They can basically do, Amazon can basically do anything at once and it will get the SERP results because it's Amazon. 
because we all use Amazon all the time or we're in the, the pocket of Jeff Bezos. Like that's how the world is right now. And like you see these small businesses like, oh, well, I've seen them experiment with their internal search in this way. It's like, cool. Do you have the same development budget as Amazon to experiment with your internal search results? Because I don't think you do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if uh, you've experienced this, but I get a lot of small businesses from time to time. They'll send me like links over to like Amazon, Nike and be like, look, they do this thing that's technically like sort of skivvy on Google's guidelines. Like it almost it's almost not there. Um, and I'm like, yeah, you you can try it. You worst case scenario is you get a manual action. Best case scenario is nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's such a seeing other competitors or like, and it can be relevant for competitors if they're similarly styled and, and, and in a similar space and things like that, that can make sense. But as soon as you start having the conversation, I'm like, oh, look at what Amazon is doing. Look at what eBay or Etsy, we're going down the e-commerce route. Like, look at what these guys are doing with their, with their side of things. Like, yeah. Also, Amazon is its own side of SEO. There are entire like sub-industry of people work under them. I don't know if you've seen an Amazon product description recently, it is keyword stuff to the nth degree and is inescapable. And it drives me insane. I, I drive my wife insane by like, oh, and I will I will read like Amazon products word for word. Mm -hmm. She'll be like, oh, um, we need to buy this thing for the house. And I was like, oh, let's get a door screen, screen door, six by five door that is a screen door, a door for your screen, a screen door. I'm like, what? Why? Why is this the product description? Didn't you just need to say that once? But apparently, keyword stuffing still happens on Amazon and still works. So, yeah, let that be a lesson to you SEOs. There. Don't use keyword from Amazon for Google or the other way around. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and then the other thing I see some larger e-commerce sites do is use meta keywords. And mm. I'm like, this is not 2013. Please <laughs> just delete it from Yoast. Just write what your product is about in the SEO title and description or in the metadata um, in, you know, I think feel like most people use Yoast still nowadays, but whatever plugin is integrated into your WordPress. <laughs> yeah, I think you're totally right. I've seen a lot of meta keywords hanging around. Funny enough, thankfully, I see it a lot when I'm doing competitor analysis. I'm like, haha, I know you're out <laughs> of date. That's good. That's a always like a positive sign of like this competitor probably doesn't know what it's doing, or as you said, hasn't updated things since twenty thirteen. So we we might be okay and we'll be able to compete with them. <laughs> Definitely. Um another thing I feel like that's for twenty thirteen ish is backlinks. Um please don't buy backlinks. Just oh, you'll yeah. you'll get them over time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it, that's a whole other question right but like yeah uh to, to kind of bring it back around to reporting yeah. and backlinks funnily enough um how would you go about that process for smaller businesses and thinking about how to report if you're actively targeting and growing and doing kind of like local growth or you're doing kind of like <clears throat> i know directories have a bad hat bad rap in a lot of places but i think there is still a lot of value in particular certain directories if they are of good quality and stuff but would you go about kind of including backlink stuff for a small business or do you think that's kind of something you'd worry about further down the road i think for small businesses your backlink strategy has to be kind of in junction with your pr strategy you know something that i always like say kind of is seo for small business you're kind of like the unintentional web developer maybe therapist, the analytics hero, whatever it may be. And with that, I think also comes PR. So, you know, if you're a small business, you know, you're participating in like the local markets, you're doing something with charity, whatever it may be, getting those backlinks is going to be far more valuable, not only just to like say, hey, Google, we're associated with these things, but also to let like the people that come to your site or come to their site know, hey, my business does these things, you know, here's how we're kind of making an impact in our community, or here's some things that we're doing in like the upcoming year, whatever it may be. Um, and then with kind of reporting on that, um, I stand by Screaming Frog for being a great technical tool. And also you can kind of see where your own site is referring out to in there. And typically, you know, that's going to associate directly back to your backlinks. And Screaming Frog, it's like, I think it's $100 US like yearly. They stay pretty affordable for most people. Like even if 
even with other tools that are like that on a monthly basis, that annual fee for Screaming Frog is just so, it's so worth it. And once you learn how to use it, um, even from like an SEO perspective, if you're just starting out, Screaming Frog is kind of the first like technical tool that I would recommend just diving into, playing around with. You can easily see like for the forest, whatever you need, it's there. <laughs> Yeah, if you think if you're working on really, really small businesses as well, and you're just starting out, you can do like 500 pages with the free Screaming Frog as well. Like, like yeah. you said, it's super duper affordable. You can even start playing around and testing with the free version as well. And I think it has so much power and value and being able to, I don't, I, again, this is going into a whole other side of things, but a lot of the way I kind of like structure a lot of the page analysis stuff and, and going through that process, do a crawl of the site, you can get page titles, you can do... Again, once you're in the paid version, you can add like custom scripts in there to say, pull out the product description from everything, even if it's not included in the metadata, pull out this particular thing out of the HTML or out of the CSS or whatever it is to see, is every product description the same length or are some ones completely neglected? Is every blog post like, do they all feature this particular number of headings or how many headings do they have? Or what types of headings are they doing? You can use crawling tools to pull out so much more information than just here's the URL, here's what the internal links are, here's the URL, whether it's you know indexed or not. There's so much other cool stuff you could be doing. I know this is a whole other conversation and <laughs> a whole other podcast episode, but yeah, I, I think you're totally right that so many people underestimate how powerful what seems like a simple tool like Screaming Frog can be when you can do loads of cool stuff with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and I think there is like some way that you could integrate, you know, Screaming Frog into Looker Studio into your reporting if you did want to go about that. Um, do an indexing report or something like that, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's also just, you know, another way going back to client education to be like, this is like the industry standard tool. If there is one tool that is on every SEO's mind, I think it is going to be Screaming Frog. So, <laughs> yeah, I recommended it for one of our clients the other week, actually. And he was like, oh, how are you getting this? Because I think they asked me about, like, oh, what are the internal links for this page so they can get rid of it? It was not supposed to be linked on anything. And I replied in like 10 minutes with here's the thing. Here's all the internal links. Here's where they're all coming from. Here's like the full chain of stuff. And he's like, how the hell did you get that? I'm like, ah, it's the in links report in Screaming Frog. And here you are. It's like, ah, OK. And he actually has gone off and started experimenting and like i said that's all part of that client education process right like i think a lot of us get into the habit of like oh i want to feel special i want to be an seo i want to be i want to be the biggest cleverest person in the room and have all this stuff and be educating the client but you build those relationships share your knowledge share the tools like oh just because the client can use screaming frog I think a lot of people suddenly go oh no they're going to start doing their own seo and they won't be my client anymore and all that kind of stuff right don't don't hoard it. Be be helpful to the business. You know, be build that relationship and be good to your clients. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And like with that, on that retention aspect too, if your job is in jeopardy because you know one tool, your job was probably already in jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that's a lot of conversation. Like, oh, the machines are going to take my job and all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, maybe get better at your job then maybe don't have one skill set that is very easily replaced by something so simple <laughs> yeah definitely yeah and um you know like with any kind of technical aspect within your reporting too i think screaming frog for most small businesses will cover anything you need i think the biggest one that i see is either indexing which you know just re-request that or replace it in for the first time in google search console um, and then also with Screaming Frog, you can kind of explain the differences between crawling versus indexing mm. to your client. And I feel like that's a fundamental SEO thing. And it also kind of makes it, okay, this is a process. Like this isn't, nothing happens instantaneously in SEO. Um, you know, I always get jealous when I see like SEM reporting and it's like, it, it happened right now. And it's like, great, I'm going to be over here for like two weeks at least checking all this. So <laughs> two weeks. Wow. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there was something uh, Daniel Foley Carter said not too long ago when we had a mere search Norwich uh, late last year that was 
Google doesn't owe you indexing. And I was like, that is such a good way of putting it. Google doesn't owe you anything. Like you have to, I think more so going forward in 2024, like you really need to prove that, especially as a small business, you need to prove that you are worthy of, as we said, ranking against these household names or bigger competitors or whatever it is. You've got to work hard. You've got to earn those rankings. You've got to earn that traffic. You don't just get it all handed to you exactly as you said right like take it 10 12 11 13 14 15 20 years ago whatever it is where you could just buy backlinks and do all kind of like pbn stuff and whatever and just build a little thing and just force a page to rank and just get traffic straight away if you're doing it the right way and you want to have this long-term growth and long-term growth for you and your client you've got to work hard and you've got to put the put the effort in right <laughs> yeah definitely and i think that kind of concept with um, EEAT especially, or just E with longer E, um, <laughs> kind of makes that easier to explain as well. Um, you know, just telling your client, hey, we have to talk about, you know, your experience with this industry or with your business. We have to talk about why you're an expert. We have to approve that by showing that we're the authority and creating different like content or whatever it may be on this subject matter. And then we have to show that we're trusted you know, and that kind of will help you rank over time as well. One of my favorite kind of resources to share is um, Aleda Sol, if you don't know who Aleda is, Aleda Solis um, put together the, um, put together like a list of the Google guideline questions in the EAT style format. And you can kind of take those questions and then like tweak them for any industry that you need be. And then, you know, come up with those questions just to kind of like prompt your clients along. I feel like with a lot of businesses, there's so much more than like that initial onboarding, even if it is so in depth and that things continuously come up over time that help kind of feedback. Like, hey, this is, this is going to take a while, but we are the experts. We are the trusted people on this. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such a, a big part and something I found with the client I mentioned earlier who started using Screaming Frog and stuff we got to the point where we were, as we mentioned earlier, we mentioned Tesco at the very start of the episode and we're looping back around at the end here. We were out ranking Tesco for some stuff. And I was like, hey, look at this. You're, you're selling this product, Tesco's selling this product, this other household name. I can't remember what the other one was actually. It wasn't Amazon, but it was something also pretty big. And we're out ranking them here because we've proven that we know we're more specialist than Tesco. We're more specialist than Amazon. You can prove that you know what you're talking about if you niche down and understand your specialist subject because Amazon sells literally everything and Tesco sells almost literally everything. <laughs> so <laughs> having your little like expert and, th and this is like focused on kind of like medical and first aid supplies as well. So it's like a, a pretty YMYL subject. You really need to prove you know what you're talking about to get these rankings. And they are and it's working and it's proving the proving the point right you're totally right where you have to understand who's an authority in that space how you can become that authority you can establish your trustworthiness with the users and the customers and they then turn into returning customers hopefully is the plan right so having that element of building the whole WAT, EEAT, however you want to say it, uh, picture, even for small businesses, I think can be a massive, massive difference. And I mean, we're talking about reporting. That's quite difficult to report on, really. But I think like exactly the example you said from Aleda, like having that conversation and opening the door to the client and saying, hey, these are the guidelines from Google. It doesn't get much better than Google saying, hey, let's do the thing. Here's a guideline to do the thing. Because a lot of the times, as I'm sure you know, really, and so plenty of the listeners and viewers know, like, we're guessing. We're kind of like, oh, yeah, we kind of interpret it this way. If Google gives you guidelines, that's that's pretty pretty good direction in the right place, right? Yeah, definitely. It's um, Google's word is golden. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, I think that is a perfect, uh, almost little tagline to end on there. <laughs> So how can people follow you if they want to follow up, uh, check you out on social media and all that kind of stuff, Riley? So on X, if you're still using it, it's Riley Hope 13. I'm also on Blue Sky at RileyHope.seo. Um, you can follow me on Instagram with that handle too. And then my website is Riley Hope, but spelled a little bit differently, R-I-L-E-Y-H-O-P-E.com. Thank you. 
Awesome. The links for all those things, no matter of the spellings and all that kind of stuff, will be in the show notes and the show description as well. So listeners, viewers, go and click the thing down below and you can go and follow Riley and everything she's doing. Awesome stuff in SEO. And that wraps us up for this week's episode of Search with Kanda. Thank you so much to Riley Hope for joining me. Thank you so much to you for listening or watching, however you're consuming Search with Kanda these days. If you're not watching us, please do go and check out the YouTube channel and Spotify if you want to come and see my face and see Riley's face and how we're chatting and all that kind of stuff. I actually quite like watching podcasts on YouTube myself. I don't 100% do it. I'm still a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to most of my podcasts. But I'm probably sort of like 70% audio, 30% video at this point. And that's saying a lot from somebody who's been podcasting and listening to podcast for nearly 13, 13, 14 years, something like that at this point. And uh, yeah, over the next couple of weeks, I'll have some fantastic guests. Of course, we will get the return of Mark Williams Cook making his debut on season three kind of in video form because we had done it in video form on the on the previous season on the Sistrix YouTube channel but this is the Kanda YouTube channel so you will see Mark and I reunited in this studio by the end of the month and basically doing our monthly SEO recap news kind of show we used to do on the Sistrix side of things of course I have plenty more guests coming up including Nate Matheson from Positional, Alex Harford Matt Coley and Erica Varanguli from SEMrush as well all coming up in the next few weeks before we hit the end of February and of course Mark and I will be back again at the end of February to do another monthly news recap basically what those shows are if you're new to the show is those specific episodes do a monthly recap of all the stuff you need to know from that month so we'll go through January and talk about all the highlights from the news, the changes, the Google updates, the various bits and pieces that have been announced and are being rumoured and all that kind of thing. Kind of what we did on the previous thing, like I said, with, with Systrix, but a little bit different, a slightly different format. And uh, yeah, kind of wrapping up what Mark talks about on his LinkedIn posts a lot. If you've seen his, here are some SEO updates you need to know kind of posts. Kind of recovering that sort of format and then also talking about what Mark covers in the core updates newsletter as well, which I mentioned at the top of the show anyway i'm rambling on i'm sure you've happy to uh finish the podcast by now so if you have stuck around thank you so much for listening of course i'll be back next week and i hope until then you have a lovely week <laughs>